Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, I was actually going to uh, do this in a video that you probably saw before. Well, it's not on the channel anymore, but um, I, I tried doing this once, so we're going to actually try to do it again. And we're going to get it right this time. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to definitely get it right this time. So, yeah. Uh, what's this video about? You can probably see the title. You can probably see what, you know, you probably already know. And if you know, that's good. But um, this is for the people that, I guess, want a quick primer on the topic. So let's just get into it. So what is what is Thelema? Thelema is basically an ideology that's one of the biggest uh, sections of the Western occult tradition. And those Big words just mean that it's uh, it's it's one of the most influential schools of thought in a uh, a very large school of thought, and it's one of the most influential because even people who practice something like Wicca would owe their their knowledge mostly to Thelema. So to understand what this is all about, we kind of have to you know look at it in a broad overview. So that's what I want to do. So what it, what is this really all about? Well, this is this this ideology is both an ideology and a system of magic. So because it's part of the Western occult tradition, it's uh, very much so tied into the idea of ceremonial magic and the idea that you can control the world around you with your your will, which is what the Lima means. So the guy most people have heard of this guy, but the guy that created this, his name is uh, Aleister Crowley, and a lot of people have different opinions on him. Some people think that he was just a weirdo who was a bit, you know, bit odd in the head and maybe wanted to make some money. And other people think that he was a prophet of some sort. Uh, I don't endorse anything this guy has written. I don't endorse anything this guy has said. I mainly make these videos to educate people. So this video is not an endorsement of Thelema. This, endor this is not an endorsement of the OTO or the Astrum Argentum. This is basically not an endorsement of anything. This is just me telling people about this so that they're better educated and so that you can actually look into things yourself because I want people to do that. I want people to learn learn and find out. So, you know, this isn't just a channel of me telling you what to think. I want you to actually go do some digging on your own. So, uh, who who was this Aleister Crowley guy? He was uh, an interesting guy who he may not have been the best person. He certainly was no role model for anyone. But what he was is he was someone who grew up in a very strict, uh, what I'll call a cult. Kind of funny that people usually grow up in cults and then go on to, to start their own, but that was the case in this one. Uh, his name was different. Uh, his name was uh, Alexander. So uh, young Alexander was born in this exclusive set called the Prim the Plymouth Brethren, and the Plymouth Brethren were basically a extreme Protestant cult. They they didn't really get along with uh, with other you know, Christians in England, and they basically thought that they were the only one ones that had the truth. And it's, it's very funny because uh, one of the things that uh, we know about young Aleister Crowley is that his mom was definitely a fervent believer in the, the Plymouth Brethren, and not so much his dad. His dad actually... Before he converted to the Plymouth Brethren cult, he used to make ale, and he made quite a quite a bit bit of money off of 
the production and sale of ale. When he joined the Plymouth Brethren, he stopped producing this ale because he, he didn't believe in drinking at that point. He, changed, he had completely changed his opinion on alcohol, so he sold the business and he retired a wealthy man. So young Alec or young Aleister Crowley didn't, he wasn't born poor, he definitely had some money and he was very comfortable in a way. He was a spoiled rich kid. So that kind of makes some sense why he would later in life, uh, through his schooling years and through his, uh, like I said, through his later life, he, uh, he definitely seemed like a rich kid and the way he treated money was like it was, you know, no big deal for him. You know, money was no object to uh, Uncle Al throughout his whole life. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's just strange. Things like that make sense when we're talking about this guy. But um, uh, in addition to treating money like it wasn't worth anything, uh, he definitely treated the secrets of the different orders that he got involved in, like the Golden Dawn, he treated those secrets like they weren't worth anything either. Uh, in, in one example of this, uh, he took the, the correspondence tables of planetary influences, uh, divine names, uh, even uh, elements, he took all those tables that, that Golden Dawn initiates were required to memorize, and he actually just published them. He published that and many other Golden Dawn secrets. So he really didn't have much regard for secrecy. He would later go on to do the same with, uh, with Freemasonry, which he got initiated into a form of Freemasonry that isn't considered uh, regular by most Freemasons. It's called the uh, called the Grand Orient, and where he got initiated was in Mexico. So he published their secrets too. He published a lot of things, but um, this dude definitely had passion, though. At some point, at some point, he seemed to have passion for it because you can see in the things that he wrote to expound on Thelema. Uh, even the Book of the Law, which he claims he didn't write. He definitely had some, uh, like I said, some passion for it. Hello? Hello? I don't know who that is, but nobody. But um, he had some passion for it, uh, for the stuff that he was uh, you know, learning, getting into, being initiated into. And it's uh, it's very interesting because you can see, you know, how all these different influences kind of came together. But I just want to read something real quick. So just so you guys can see what I'm looking at right now and you know I know I'm going to get accused by certain people that um, you know I'm going back to my vomit but here you go this thing right here is uh, one of the most known symbols of the Lima it's the unicursal hexagram unicursal means you can do it in one motion so like like that and you know no no breaks in there but, um, yeah, this is a, the unicorn, this, this symbol actually came from the Golden Dawn. The Golden Dawn was the first to use it. And it's very interesting that the most identifiable symbol of the Lima actually came from the Golden Dawn. But also the pentagram, too, as you can see down there, right here. This is a Golden Dawn symbol that got popularized by it. So, like I said, this is one of the biggest, uh, biggest, I guess you could say, sections of the uh, the Western occult tradition. And there you can see, uh, there's our boy, there he is, uh, there's Uncle Al, with the stele of revealing right there, a sword, uh, 
There's, I think that's the book of the law right there. And a, 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 one of those things, that ball thing, you can see it right there, that, um, I forget what those are called, that's really weird, I'm drawing a blank here, but, um, it's those things you see fortune tellers using. Oh, a crystal ball, yeah, crystal ball, that's it. So you see, for some reason he's got a crystal ball there. <laughs> Yeah, Zoom was going crazy, but yeah, uh, like I said, um, this is one of the biggest sections of the Western occult tradition. Uh, Vilima is a Western esoteric and occult social or spiritual philosophy and new religious movement founded in the early 1900s by Alistair Crowley, an English writer, mystic, occultist, ceremonial magician. And ceremonial magician. The word Thelema is the English transliteration of the Koine Greek Thelema, will from the word Theo, from the word Thelo. Thale, In 1904, Crowley wrote that he received the Book of the Law. Like I said, this is what um, he says happened. He said that uh, the, the en an entity dictated the book to him. And uh, I think that's nonsense. Uh, but yeah, the Book of the Law dictated to him by an entity named Iwas, which was to serve as the foundation of the religious and philosophical system he called the Lima. Crowley identified himself as the prophet of the New Age, the Aeon of Horus, which the previous ones were Isis and Osiris, uh, based on a spiritual experience that he and his wife, Rose Edith, had in Cairo, Egypt in 1904. By his account, a, po a possibly non-corporal being that called itself Iwas contacted him through Rose and subsequently dictated a text known as the Book of the Law, or Liber All Veil Legis, which outlined the principles of the Lima. The Thelemic pantheon, a collection of gods and goddesses, either literally exist or serve the symbolic archetypes or metaphors, include a number of deities, primarily the trio adopted from the ancient Egyptian religion, which are three speakers of the Book of the Law, Nuit, Hadi, and Rahur Kui. This is kind of interesting because I, I've never heard this before, but in at least one instance, Crowley described these, these deities as literary, as a literary convenience. Crowley later writings included related commentary and hermeneutics, but also in, uh, additional inspired writings that he collectively called the Holy Books of the Lima. He, was all, he, he also associated the limbic spiritual practice with concepts rooted in occultism, yoga, and Eastern and Western mysticism, especially the Kabbalah. And then it gets into how all of this influenced things that came later like Wicca and Satanism. You know, it's kind of funny how cults build off each other. You know, they just make, uh, you know... <laughs> They make new cults happen. It's like people make people. <laughs> Some scholars such as Hugh Urban also believe the Lima to have influenced on the development of Scientology. Oh, that's right. I've talked about Scientology. You know, that weird cult. I've definitely talked about Scientology. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard was uh, influenced by Jack Parsons. Yeah, they mentioned Jack Parsons here. That's interesting. Yeah, Jack Parsons, uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Grant, uh, James Less or Lease. Never heard of him, but I've heard of Jack Parsons and Kenneth Grant, but. So, Wikipedia kind of skips a lot, but they uh, they get to the heart of things pretty quickly. 
So what the whole summation of the lemma is, is that it's do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, meaning the adherents of the lemma should seek out and follow their true path. Some people have interpreted that as like an anarchistic, you know, whatever you want, man, type thing. Uh, love is the law, love under will, i.e. the nature of the law at the lemma is love, but love itself is subsidiary to finding and manifesting one's authentic purpose or mission. So that's a... I guess that's a brief summary, and Wikipedia is good for brief summaries, not for any kind of complexity. So they go and do things that I'm not going to get into, things like historical precedent, like uh, Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. Hippo. <laughs> I can't believe that's an actual name, Augustine of Hippo. And then the the historical Abbey of Thelema. And Francois Rabelais. Which I know I butchered the French, but um yeah, let me know how you actually say Francois Rabelais. Let me just show you what I'm looking at right now here. There you can see it, uh, F-R-A-N-C with the little, little tail thingy, O-I-S-R-E-B-E-L-I-A-I-S, yeah, R-E-B-E-L-A-I-S, okay, so someone who knows French needs to let me know how to pronounce that, that name, because I definitely don't know how to pronounce French. I know that was pretty terrifying, wasn't it? <laughs> I should have made horror movies instead of making educational educational videos, but maybe one day I'll make, you know, horror yeah, horror that scary if I can aspire to it. <laughs> so yeah, um Francois Rabelais was a Franciscan and later Benedictine monk of the sixteenth century. He eventually left the monastery to study medicine. And supposedly this was an influence on, on Crowley. I don't know. Um, so Aleister Crowley's system at the Lima begins with the Book of the Law, which is the one that I said he probably didn't, you know, didn't get from an extra, you know, he didn't get it from an outside source. He made it himself. Who's a, who, which bears the official name Libra Alveo Legis, like I said. It was written in Cairo, Egypt during the honeymoon with his new wife, Rose Crowley. This small book contains three chapters, each of, one, each of which he said he'd written in exactly one hour beginning at noon on April 8th, April, April 9th, and April 10th, uh, 1904. I don't buy that for a second, but a small book contains three chapters, each of which he said to have written... In exactly one hour, beginning at noon on April 8th. April, yeah. Yeah, he wrote that he took dictation from an entity named Iwas, which I don't, I don't think that was true at all, but make up your own mind. You know, do some research. Uh, who he later identified as his holy guardian angel. He says it was too complex for him to have written it. What a flex. What a humble brag. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, he did basically what every cult leader does. You know, Muhammad, uh, Joseph Smith, you know, you can probably think of five more, but yeah, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, and the rest. <laughs> So yeah, this this has Egyptian gods and it has uh, stuff from the Book of Revelation, 
you know, just crazy stuff. I definitely encourage anyone that wants to definitely go read that Lee Brawl. Definitely do read some of the writings of Aleister Crowley. Go dig into it to find out, you know, find out what I've basically told you. What I'm basically saying right now. That it's all a bunch of nonsense. But, you know, like any other cult, a little bit of exposure, a little, little bit of education, you know, doesn't hurt. So, uh <laughs> The fact that it influenced Scientology is a big, big one for me because I definitely consider Scientology to be an evil cult. But yeah, so uh, I'll talk about this in the future. We'll keep the videos coming and uh, more cults will get exposed on this channel along with other topics too, you know, because we don't like keeping it to one thing. But I'll see you in the next one.